Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm Joy Boya, yeah. and I'm your moderator for this third and final discussion of the Resiliat Kenya series, uh, which is a series of virtual debates and idea sharing where stakeholders from the cultural and creative industries have been examining the resilience and sustainability of the creative economy in the context of COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And as I've done before, I'd like to thank UNESCO under whose auspices this event is being hosted in partnership with the Department of Culture in the Ministry of Sports, Culture and Heritage, the Kenyan National Commission uh, for UNESCO, as well as the Creative Economy Working Group, Tuaweza Communications, Alliance Francaise and the Godin Arts Center. And I'd also like to thank the attendees who have enlivened and enriched these discussions so far with their comments and questions. And it's great to see um, some of the same ones who have been with us joining again today. And to set us off, I'd like to welcome and invite the director, uh, not the director, sorry, the UNESCO National Program Officer for Culture in Kenya, uh, Ms. Judy Ogana, to give us the opening remarks. Welcome, Judy. Thank you very much, um, Joy, for that introduction and um, welcome to everybody. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UNESCO's Regional Office for Eastern Africa, it is an honor for me to welcome you all to the third Resilient Debate, whose theme is bridging the gap between policy and practice. The overall theme for this series of discussions is crafting and reshaping the creative economy for resilience and sustainability in the context of COVID-19. COVID as we can all acknowledge, the global COVID-19 pandemic has had severe negative impacts on the culture and creative industries. UNESCO launched the Global Resilient Movement on 15th April, 2020, aiming to raise awareness of the effects of COVID-19 on the cultural sector with a view to contributing to the solutions of the sector's resilience. To date, more than 100 resilient debates have been organized and 27% have been held in Africa. The unpredictability of the COVID-19 situation has compelled us to think about the sector's resilience in the context of COVID-19. Thus, we no longer wait for after COVID simply because we don't know how long this state of affairs will last. As a sector, we need to plan for short and long-term measures to adjust and pivot in this new normal. For the sustainability of the creative economy, we need to gain clarity on government actions in facilitating business opportunities, sector statistics, and copyright environment to benefit the industry and how such actions intersect with practice. This webinar will discuss opportunities for building interconnectivity between agencies and reforms that can be made and implemented for, them for a more cohesive and resilient cultural sector. We hope to take stock of the various mechanisms that the government and civil society have been put, have put in place to promote the industry and the extent to which this support the sustainability and its growth. Today's discussion builds on the first two resilient discussions um, that identified opportunities to strengthen institutions and practice in the economy, in the creative economy, sought to leverage and, and uh, the dynamic digital ecosystem and explored ways to stimulate the creative industry where the, crea uh, the COVID-19 crisis had accentuated inequalities. Following this resilient, the series of resilient um, discussions, we will compile recommendations gleaned from the three debates and share with the ministry, the Kenya Ministry of Sports, Culture and Heritage and stakeholders of the sector. These robust discussions would not have been possible without the, our valued partners. At this juncture, allow me to express my our appreciation to our collaborators of this program, which include the Ministry of Sports, Culture and Heritage, the Kenya National Commission for UNESCO, Alliance Francaise, the Creative Economy Working Group, the Godown Arts Center, and Tuaweza Communications. On behalf of our partners, I would also like to express our sincere gratitude to our distinguished panelists for taking the time to participate in this webinar and their willingness to share their vast experience 
and insights in supporting the culture and creative sector. I would also like to thank all who are connected to this debate for your engagement and interest in joining this important discussion today. I wish all of us a productive deliberation um, during this webinar and hope to draw some critical recommendations and action points for the resilience of the creative economy in Kenya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judy. Thank you very much, Judy Ogana, who is the National Program Officer for Culture in Kenya with UNESCO. Okay, so we did wonder actually how many attendees would have today. You know, the title of this particular discussion is bridging the gap between policy and practice. And I suspect that the practice is tired of discussions around bridging the gap between policy and practice. But I think we're about to have actually a robust and interesting discussion. And when I introduce the panelists, I hope that you'll appreciate the various directions from which this discussion will engage. But before we go there, I'd just like to also thank um, creatives who have been part of this process. Uh, Michael Soy, who has given us access to his paintings, uh, which have featured in the publicity of all of the, Resili the Resiliat Kenya sessions so far. And in this particular session, Ketable Music, who provided the music video that was played at the beginning as we settled down. So thank you to them as well. Just to quickly recap and summarize for those who may be joining for the first time, um, the, the, the areas or the focus of the previous two resilient forums that we, we've had, uh, these focused of course on strategies for sustainable recovery and resilience of our creative sector. From the perspective of the practice where we spoke with artists and artist organizations, and also from the vantage point of the ecosystem. And in those two discussions, I think some key gaps were foregrounded and these included financial resourcing, where a lack of financial reserves or financial uh, safety net, and a lack of a consistent locally rooted uh, arts funding resourcing was seen to, to be missing. Um, systemic and structural gaps were also noted that despite being a vibrant sector, there are many vulnerabilities, uh, which we see in a nascent creative ecosystem, and these have been amplified. And then of course, we're sitting in a digital moment. I think we have been talking about digital acceleration um, with new digital imperatives. And of course, this has also exposed or re-exposed some serious economic and political inequities. And today we look at how practice and policy can partner effectively together by bridging gaps that do or could undermine the resilience and sustainability of the creative sector. And it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists today, six very well accomplished individuals. So I'd like to begin by introducing, and when I introduce you, you can just sort of raise your hand so that the attendees know who is who. Uh, I begin by introducing Mr. Edward Sigay. Uh, Buona Sigay is the executive director of the Kenya Copyright Board. He is a legal practitioner in his own right with a vast experience in the area of intellectual property and especially in the field of copyright. We also have Dr. Mshai Mwangola, who is a performance scholar and, and oratorist. She performs with the Oriture Collective, but is also a researcher and a policy activist in the area of culture, arts, and theatre. We have with us also uh, Benjamin Mushiri, who is a national account statistics expert. He's currently a senior manager with the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. Simon Maura is another of our panelists. He's the secretary of the filmmaker association known as Riverwood Ensemble. He's a film and TV producer in his own right and has won awards for the same. Karibu sana, Simon. Um, Ms. Liz Lenjo is founder and managing consultant with My IP, which is a legal studio that specializes in IP, in entertainment, media, and fashion law. And she's also an advocate with the High Court of Kenya. And we welcome Liz. And last but not least, we have Mr. Nyongesa Wafula, who is the Deputy Director of Enterprise Development at the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development. And he has over 30 years experience in micro and small enterprise development. So I think you can see that we'll be looking at this question of bridging the gap between policy and practice, not only from the direction of, of the cultural sector, but of course, looking at the question of IP, looking at the macro, the micro and uh, uh, economy uh, more generally, and of course, um, speaking to practitioners. 
So I'd like just to begin by thinking about gains that we've made in the sector um, specifically in the micro and small and medium uh, enterprises sector and in the wider economy more generally. What sort of gains have we made up until the pandemic took hold? Because I think that when we find ourselves in an adverse situation that can significantly shift our fortunes as we now see the coronavirus is doing, we often think back on the gains we have made and we think about how the situation threatens to erode those gains. Are the things that we've worked so hard for about to become nothing? But we also ask ourselves, what could we have done better? What should we have paid more attention to? So I'd like us to consider these gains first and I'd like to begin with Vanessa Gay, if I may. All right, thank yeah, you. So Mr. So Mr. Sugay, I will, I'll put a question to you. Yeah, I'll put a question to you. So now at the heart of the creative economy, of course, is, is this idea, this notion of intellectual property rights and copyright mm -hmm. is, is one type of IP, of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. It protects the works of authors and other related rights surrounding authorship. And I know that the Kenya Copyright Board, just like the practitioners in the creative sector, had made certain achievements in, in this area of IP for the sector. Uh, and now that we are sort of sitting on a pause button with the pandemic, are there things that you see when you reflect back on the two or three years of achievements, are there things that you see uh, might be rendered invalid, might be eroded? But more importantly, what significant actions do you think you've managed to achieve for the sector that we really need to make sure we do not lose at this particular point in time? Thank you very much, uh, Joy, for this opportunity. And I thank uh, the organizers for, for bringing us together to have this conversation. Um, the last three years, have, uh, you have seen a number of uh, changes in the sector. Uh, I will just identify uh, two or three of them. The biggest um, uh, achievement that I can, I, I, I can name here is uh, the reform uh, in the area of uh, copyright legislation uh, to bring into the center uh, the, the artist um, and, um, and uh, bring the oversight of the, of the collective management organization into, into a better uh, place. Um, the same legislation has also brought in um, an ability uh, for an, an artist or an author to manage their rights online uh, by uh, preventing other people from uh, interfering. Uh, we, we provided for what we call internet service provider uh, liability provision uh, into our legislation. Uh, so we, uh, that, that, is a, that was a good uh, intervention. And uh, the fourth intervention in the area of legislation also brought in the, the um, what you call the resale right, which we didn't have before. So we, we provided an additional income stream for people in the visual arts sector. And finally, um, we also made changes to the legislation for the purposes of uh, ensuring that um, uh, people understand and uh, are able to uh, join into the copyright register. And, um, and that brings me to the second um, area that I can, uh, I can name as, a, as an achievement, which is sustainable. That is, uh, in addition to making that change in the law, we also made um, now provisions for the purposes of online registration of copyright. Um, which is now um, part of a, a four-part uh, ICT intervention that the government has brought in. Uh, the other three parts, apart from the national registration, uh, the, the national registration the register, is also the we have a, we've created a, a, an opportunity for the CMOs to collect monies online without having to knock on doors. And uh, we created a, another ICT intervention also for, for them to be able to monitor uh, the use of their works in the media. And the third uh, intervention in the four-part series is um, 
having a, a disbursement portal so that we, we know from, you know, how much money gets in and how much money gets out. Uh, and we are able to supervise it better. Uh, so the, those are the two parts, um, the two areas where I, I see we've made a lot of progress. Despite uh, this uh, COVID-19, uh, which uh, you call 20, I hope we don't have COVID-20. Uh, <laughs> so we've made, um, I don't think we will uh, roll back any of these things. My only okay, worry no, sir, is... Thank uh, you. Okay. Yeah, no, no, please, please, please indicate your worry because I was just going to say that um, that I think that what you're expressing is actually some good confidence that the the the, the reforms that have happened with the the, the act um, are things that seem to be sustainable. Um, and I was going to ask you whether yeah. whether you're seeing any any threats in in terms of the uncertain moment. And so please <laughs> do express the worry that you have. My my threat is actually my threat. The only threat for me is uh, the economy. Uh, because uh, the economy, uh, in the, the economy is not doing well. Was not doing well again at that time, but it was doing better before COVID. Now with the um, challenge of COVID, um, entertainment has been affected because it requires people to come together, uh, spend money on uh, on the ancillary industries, including uh, having a beer or uh, some food. And uh, this, the, the, the initial impact really, the, the industry has been impacted from January um, since the, the, the Christmas season. Uh, so it's, uh, my worry is um, if many of these um, establishments do not survive, you will not be able to get uh, opportunities for artists to make a living by uh, performance or uh, by way of uh, receiving royalties uh, for the use of their works. Already the, the biggest contributor of uh, royalties has been the media. At the moment, uh, at the beginning of the year, you are looking at um, attaining a collection of beyond 1.5 billion in the area of uh, the CMO sector. At the moment, we've lost um, over 100 million, which we are expecting from the media. And uh, apart from one or two, all of them are struggling. And we, we don't know how they will survive in this pandemic. So my worry is um, other priorities will come. Art and, um, <laughs> and the sector generally of entertainment becomes uh, something that we an afterthought. That's my worry. And it will have an impact on, uh, on the ability of people to make a career choice on this area or uh, focus their time or uh, do quality work. And even, um, you know, the, you know, the, um, you know, investing uh, in, or uh, following up, asserting some of the rights that they have. No, thank you. And I think that that is an important concern. I think in the second um, forum in the second discussion, we did raise the level of conversation to looking at the ecosystem, in fact, including the wider economy, because the impacts are interconnected. And, and of course, when the wider economy suffers, as, as we clearly see, uh, the livelihood of artists are very much dependent on some of those, what you called ancillary businesses. And when those begin to fold, it means that the artists' um, opportunity or space for also doing their work is, is much reduced and much limited. So that is that is an important concern. Um, Liz Lenjo, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Liz. Hi, how now, are Liz, you? Just, good, good. Just, just to, to build on what um, uh, uh, Buona Sige has just said, I mean, you also, of course, work in the IP space, in the um, intellectual property space, and you work with the everyday concerns of, of artists and creatives. Um, yes. And I'd just like you to share what your reading is of of how you've seen the understanding and the capabilities of, of practitioners within the sector change in recent years. So have these, have, has, has anything changed? Have they become stronger? Have they become more confident? Was the sector actually building um, a, a kind of a stronger foundation? And then I think to also express the same way that uh, Buenasigue has, has, has tried to do, what your own concerns might be 
um, during this this period. Okay, um, so I think it's it would be very true to say that. Uh, so many of our creatives have been embracing intellectual property laws and, and, and the need for structures. Um, so we, ha we have been seeing in the past five, 10 years, a lot, an, an increase in registration of copyrights, of mm -hmm. trademarks, and even of designs to some extent. Um, so that has been, has been good. And, and even in the last two years, uh, up to COVID happened, um, I think the numbers were even on a stage People were like, so what do we do now? Um, you know, uh, like Sige has said, now there's an issue of priority. And it's true mm -hmm. that we fear that uh, the priorities are likely to change. You know, people had set aside some monies for their businesses, either for, you know, for some registrations, for legal advice. And now they're pulling back. Uh, you know, they're mm -hmm. like, okay, we don't know what's going to go down. Uh, I was supposed to, you know, release a, 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 um, a line for my fashion brand and now I'm not sure what I should do. I think I should sit on the money because uh, the, nobody will buy, right? Mm. Um, so there's been that uh, really serious concern. But coincidentally, the, the funny thing is that when you look uh, at the online trends, especially uh, in terms of marketing, marketing in the online space has become uh, more prominent. Uh, there are those who are very aware of issues about copyright and trademarks mm -hmm. and how they manage themselves and their brands. And at the same time, we have seen others who have, who have had their intellectual property being infringed because mm -hmm. now uh, there are those now who have, have, have realized the internet is a good space uh, to do marketing and to get known. And then now they're like, oh, if I find anything on the internet, it's fair game, I will use it. Um, so we are finding ourselves, you know, slapping people with a lot of cease and desist and take down notices and we are telling them just because it's on the internet, it's not free. <laughs> um, so we, we've, we've been seeing that a lot. So uh, for some, they're, they're, in terms of gains, they're still making some money, especially in the retail se sector. So many mm -hmm. people are still buying despite uh, the issues. At the same time, uh, you know, if someone is infringing on your intellectual property, you're not sure whether you're going to ask for money or you just a season desist is enough, uh, you know, because everyone is concerned mm -hmm. and they're like, you know what, this is an ecosystem that we are part of. So as much as I'm being wronged, does it make sense for me to start, you know, figuring out how to take them to court or, or impose a lawyer on them or things like that? So it's it's been a very interesting space. It's a plus though, because now um, some people are managing to get their brands more out there um, mm -hmm. because now they realize the internet is the only space to be. So now they're, they're figuring out what have I not done right? You know, do I have the necessary pop-up contracts or terms and conditions as we call them? Uh, you know, how can I engage a lawyer uh, and figure out how they'll become affordable? So we've also been making a lot of concessions for some of our clients and saying, you know what, we appreciate uh, that the economy is in a place where nobody anticipated. Um, so we are, we are figuring out interesting quid pro quo sort of arrangements and we're like, okay, you know what, we, we can benefit from each other. Uh, make some concessions here as, as, as a lawyer, but at the same time, I'm getting some gains. So when you just look at even my IP Instagram, uh, we've had a lot of issues regarding either image rights or some fashion matters. And, and you know, we're telling our clients, you know what, you don't need to just necessarily pursue the law in its traditional sense, but there are also other soft things that we have seen uh, have emanated through other jurisprudence, like in the US, where there have been case laws where you know a designer is told, you know what, when someone wrongs you, you need to push it out there online and say, I'm not affiliated with the following brands, so that then people are aware what is original and what is associated with you and what someone is misrepresenting to be associated with you. So we've we've also seen, even for us lawyers, we have become very creative in how to approach the law and, and less conservative because we have had a very conservative approach um, to the legal mm -hmm. practice as compared to like US practitioners, yeah. No, I think that's interesting to hear because I think um, again in the second resilient when, which was now really focusing on the, on the digital, um, the, the opportunities, but also the challenge of the space came up. And I think that um, uh, later on in this discussion between with, with you and, um, and Sige making inputs, we can begin to think about some of the implications of course of the digital being the primary space for, for doing business right now. And I think, as you're saying, Liz, some of the the innovative approaches of trying to see how to how to deal with uh, with with issues of infringement um, without without uh, the, the you know going going to court, 
how to alert people and raise awareness around around these questions in in in, in innovative ways, as you as you put it. Okay, no good, good. But I think good to hear that it, from your perspective also you feel that um, sector practitioners are, are, are beginning to get a handle of of how to work with the lawyers and with the law around um, securing and protecting their rights. And as yeah. as you mentioned, seeing an uh, you know a sort of a, a small surge in the registration of of um, of uh, of rights and 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 yes. trademarks and patents and things like that. Yeah. Okay, so Buana Mushiri, I know that you, of course, do not sit in the creative economy space, but you are very important to us because um, you are in the business of, of, uh, of counting things that help us think and plan. Uh, if there's one thing that we've been hearing a lot of during this pandemic um, from experts, um, it's really gather data, track data, work with data. Um, in fact, they said sort of saying work with the scientists and you as a, as a scientist in statistics, um, working with the with the National Bureau of Statistics, I think every year, of course, you you measure our economy, and one of the sectors that, in fact, you do measure, um, as as the KNBS, as the Bureau of Statistics, is the arts, entertainment, and recreation sector. And I know that the arts, recreation, and entertainment sector, coupled with information and communications, collectively then comprise what we call the creative economy. I also want you to give us your take of of how you read the numbers of the creative economy in the last three years or so. Um, what is the data telling us? What have you been seeing? Um, and, and so that we can understand where we were at just before um, the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, began to put a halt to some of our activities. Buona Mushiri. Buona Mushiri, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, I think I had uh, muted, but I- Ah, okay, no, Karibu. Yes, yes, we can. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Joy. I also want to uh, thank the organizers of this uh, webinar, the participants and uh, my fellow panelists. And uh, thank you for the interest in uh, the area of statistics. And uh, as you rightly put it, uh, when you look at the classification of uh, industries, as far as the ICT is, is concerned, the one that we use for, for doing like the GDP and uh, economic statistics in general, we actually don't have uh, an activity that is called a uh, creative economy. Rather, you can have, we actually have them split across a number of activities within the classification. And one area that uh, wholly covers, or not wholly, but uh, wholly is a, uh, made of creative arts in my thinking is the one that you have mentioned that is arts entertainment and recreation then we have a lot of it under publishing that is uh, information and communication we have publishing we have motion picture we have radio and tv we have telecommunications among others then we also have um, other activities like uh, organization of convention and uh, trade trade shows i think it has got some element of uh, creative art and then we have Another one under administrative uh, support, we call it uh, administrative su uh, support activities that, because that is where we have photographic, everything to do with the video photographic, whether it's for commercial or for consumer purposes, whether it's aerial or they, they are covered there. So we can basically say that um, the creative industry is covered within very many sectors of the economy as defined in the international standard industrial classification for all economic activities. Uh, when you look at the economic survey, there are some that come out, but uh, lump together at, uh, at, um, at an aggregated level. And one of them is the information and communication, which has actually been performing very well for the last five years. And it has actually averaged at around, the, the, the growth rate is at an average of about five, uh, 11 point something. But it's also good to note that uh, there are two subsectors within that one of them is telecommunication. The other one is uh, publishing, broadcasting, and other IT and information activities. The driver there is telecommunication because it has actually been growing at an average of about uh, over, over 11, while the other one has actually averaged at about 3%. So overall, the average is actually 9.7%. And then we have arts and entertainment. It has also been doing quite well because over the last five years, the average is about 5.7. Then in terms of the one 
that I called administrative and support services, which actually only has a small portion of uh, creative economy. Uh, it has actually been averaging at about 3.7. So overall, we can say that uh, the performance of the creative industry or the creative economy has been better than the, the performance of the economy as a whole. So I think uh, the creative economy in our judgment from the statistics point of view has actually been performing better than the overall economy. I think that's, that's amazing to hear. And I think it's something that of course, we, we, we don't appreciate until somebody like you gives us the numbers or whether or until we look at the numbers ourselves. Um, because, you know, of course the creative economy has been, and Mushai will probably speak to this, is, is, is trying to seek recognition and, uh, and, and, and a solid partnership with government. Um, and numbers of course speak to government. And to be able to say that the creative economy actually um, is growing faster than the general economy if you compare them is an important, is an important piece of, of information. But so for you then, Bwana Mushiri, what would be your concern? Um, because it seems that, that we have been doing well and the anticipation is that we would continue to do well. Uh, what would be your concern now that we are looking at, at a possible halt of, of global activities and even our own national acti activities for at least a year or, or a slowdown for at least a year? Well, I'm, I'm very optimistic because I think we are dealing with a, a sector that is uh, of creative thinkers and uh, where all the innovators are lying. And therefore, if actually creative economy would uh, feel like they are a bit desperate, I think the rest of the economy should even be more, more concerned. So to me, I have a lot of confidence that uh, the creative economy should uh, do very well because I think that is where we have the the creative thinking, that is where we have the innovators, that is where we should actually be relying on. But uh, there is hope because uh, as um, Liz has said, the, 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 in terms of coverage in the ICT, especially the internet, almost everybody is running there, including mm -hmm. the way we are collecting statistics. So I think if the creative art can think of leveraging on uh, technology, then they have a better, We'll be having more, 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 more what more. Um, the market would be better, mm -hmm. probably than before COVID, because we now have more people running to internet to do things, mm -hmm. and therefore, if you are to sell yourself through the uh, the internet, I think you'll get better audience, you'll get more more customers, and I'm I'm not so worried, and I like the opening remarks that uh, let's not talk of post COVID because we don't know when it will ever come this probably might be the way of doing things for the next couple of years, because if COVID is going to be with us for the next three years, I think that is something that we cannot wait until we say that we are now going to be back to normal after three years. And who knows, maybe nature has a way of saying that it's time for us to change way of doing things. I like it when I see some, like uh, I've been looking at the TV and then you are looking at some people and then you are told, I bought some oranges from a Mercedes, then I bought some cabbages from, because I think those people are thinking, how do I continue living? Because I think we must continue living. And uh, the good thing is that uh, as much as there is COVID, the product of the creative economy is still popular to the customers. So we need it. So I think it's just an issue of how do we package our products and then how do we make it reach the customers? But I'm very optimistic. I'm not so much uh, worried. So I would say that I don't have a lot of concern because I know we are dealing with the critical thinkers. We are thinking. We are dealing with the innovators. I know a way out will be found. I think um, if you look at what we are using now, I think it's a product of uh, creative economy. So I'm very optimistic that we are going to be having a way out. But I would imagine that we are going to think of. Uh, leveraging on technology, because I think it is going to be very helpful. But uh, that does not mean that, uh, that um, everything- the, the challenges. Yeah, no, the absolutely. challenges are there. But uh, I think uh, we don't panic, because when you panic, then uh, you slow down your reasoning and therefore you don't do anything. But I'm very hopeful that things are going to work out right. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Bwana Mashiri. Now I'm trying to juggle um, 
seeing what people are saying on the side, which are being sent to me on the phone. Thank you very much, Hazita and Judy. And let me just bring these in before I bring in the other three panelists. So I know that Buanasige had his hand up. I think he wanted to say something in response to Buana Mushiri. Um, yeah. So I'll allow you to do that. And then Liz, if you are on standby, I think there's a question um, from a fine artist. All so right, Buana sure. Sige, kindly, yeah. Okay. Mine is um, to appreciate um, Buana Mushiri's input here. I think for a long time we've talked about uh, the role of statistics in advocacy. Um, I'm happy that um, Mushiri and uh, his colleagues at the Kenya KNBS uh, have been able to glean out some of the uh, critical statistics. But uh, for me, I have a suggestion that we need to have a discussion with them so that we, we follow maybe the international classification. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you mentioned yesterday, and I think uh, it's valid, that uh, UNESCO have been undertaking some of these studies uh, to weigh the value and the contribution of this sector into the economy. The UNCTAD have been edited as well, and WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, have, have uh, a handbook on how to conduct studies uh, on the contribution and um, they they did a study I think we, I can share with uh, Mushiri I'll appreciate if I have his email so that we can have a discussion so that uh, the following uh, subsequent um, uh, statistical uh, the processes we, we should be able to get some of these things uh, together with other parameters uh, so that we now move from the traditional economy to the knowledge economy. We, we now, we are now, we still, we, we're focusing on tea, coffee, and uh, mining and tourism. While um, we are paying lip service to this sector, while we understand the potential it has, we, we don't want to already start weighing and uh, seeing how we can uh, invest more in it. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Monisike. So Liz, this is a question from somebody on the chat bar on the side. She asks, she says, I'm a fine artist and most of my paintings are online. How effective are the IP laws and what is to stop someone in Bulgaria from printing and selling my work? I think the first place to start <laughs> is to always remind uh, all the creatives and anyone in general that uh, all these uh, all laws are territorial intellectual property is territorial so you're protected in the country of registration now unfortunately in the digital space we do not have any legal instrument that you know sort of tackles that cross-border issue on, on infringement right uh, however because when you put your intellectual property online like if it's your art it's your paintings and whatnot you should also embrace certain mechanisms to sort of be able to police your work so it includes, uh, you know, what kind of file are you uploading? Uh, the mm -hmm. platform that you're uploading, is it downloadable? Uh, what kind of file have you also submitted? You know, is your intention just to market or to also distribute? Um, so again, if you're distributing, what channels are you using? What kind of contracts have you signed with them? Um, so that then some of these uh, platforms may also mm -hmm. sort of oversee on your behalf. Um, Again, you know, are you using metadata, um, you know, to sort of be able to figure out how your work is being produced and whatnot. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to the printing aspect, like in this situation, there is nothing much you can do. However, when it comes to issues of now the distribution and sharing of the work online and the usage, it's possible. Uh, as long as they are policing and, and we are able to identify, you know, the infringing party, we are able to sort of uh, go after them you know, it can either be alternative dispute resolution and we're figuring out how we are going to, you know, mediate or, or arbitrate. And then if worst comes to worst, uh, you know, that system of, of, of lawyers, you know, like for, for my IP legal studio, we have lawyers uh, around Africa and the US and, and the UK. We yeah. also talk to them and say, you know what, I have a client, uh, this is a situation, how can you help? You know, so they, they will also help us to, <clears throat> sorry, to intervene and figure out how do we find out who is this company, where are they situated? Are they even a real company or there's just some bot online that's just trolling? Um, so, but I would tell them, you know what, especially for like an, an, a painter or a fine artist, 
they need to be very deliberate. Be aware of the challenges technology will have uh, on your business and then be deliberate with what you upload so that then you know what you upload may be more of a marketing strategy and and you're okay with them being downloaded uh, and you figured out either partnerships you know are you going to have a certain entity sell them as wallpaper uh, at the same time they market you um, mm-hmm. so that then any other work that you have now you can you can be directly commissioned or you, you can you know sell it directly yourself mm-hmm. No, thank you, Liz. That was quite comprehensive. And I, and I hope that that young lady um, can follow up with you on my IP, you know, yeah. for, 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 for further, further insights into that. OK, so let me try and bring in the other three um, uh, panelists now who haven't spoken yet. And I would I'd like to start with um, uh, Bonafula. Um, so Bonafula, the, um, you know, micro, small and medium uh, businesses, of course, are the rock bed of Kenya's economic activity. And many creatives and creative businesses actually operate within this MSME environment or sector. And as I I tried to explain in the in the previous resilience, one of the big gaps that was recognized and discussed, um, of course, was the lack of financial reserves or financial safety nets for 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 the creatives. Uh, But this is, of course, not a new problem if you look at it uh, in light of the bigger micro and small and medium-sized enterprise environment. So what do you see has been a notable difference in this particular space um, that has been made by the state and by the sector in the last two to three years? So in other words, how have MSMEs um, advanced or progressed in the last two to three years from your perspective? If, if they have, if they have. Can you hear us? Bonofula, are you there? Your, your, your microphone is off. Okay. Ah, there you go, there you go. Okay, okay. Uh, I, 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 hello? Yes, we can hear you, Karibu. Yeah, you asked a question, huh? and uh, somehow my phone had gone off, but now it's ah. on. Okay, did so, you hear the question? I think I had part of the question. Yes. You asked me about uh, what, do we, what we have done. Yeah, As just yeah. What yeah? What is yeah? What have you seen? Is the difference that has taken place hmm. for MSMEs in the hmm. last two to three years um, a positive yeah. difference? Mm. First of all, uh, before I start, uh, hello. Yes, we can hear hello? you. Please continue. We can hear you. you. Continue. Yeah, yes, I, I love the, 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 the Mr. Uh, the decision, Mr. Mushiri, for his. Uh, uh, for his positive thinking about uh, the, 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 the creative sector. And also, I would like to misfile the fears of Mr. K, because me, I, I, I think as an, an, as an entrepreneur, uh, when things change, you also change with them, and then you make sure that you succeed. Uh, like the issue of saying that uh, COVID may stop, uh, may, may hinder the progress of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the creative industry, uh, it's not, it's not for us to fear, because the people are entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs really think hard and find a solution to their problem. Like for example, you can look at the national newspapers. Eh? They're now they're now selling their newspapers on uh, online, because people now don't want to sell the hard copy of the, the newspaper. Now they're doing it online, and I think they are making they're making progress. So uh, from the perspective of the ministry or the department uh, of industrialization, what I can say. Uh, some of the positive things that have, have happened in the last uh, like three years is uh, one of them is a review of the MSC policy. The MSC policy had been, have been reviewed. Uh, the first uh, policy was uh, the 2005 version. So this year we reviewed our MSC policy, and we believe that if this policy is implemented uh, right, uh, the, 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 the MSC sector will grow. Another thing that you have done so far, you have also put uh, in place uh, something we call the local content policy. Local content policy encourages uh, uh, people to buy or to purchase or to, or, 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 or to procure from within the country. And this uh, local content policy, if it's also implemented properly, uh, we believe that SME sector will be, will, be, will be boosted and will do better than uh, uh, previously. There are other government initiatives like Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, which has been put in place, which I think also can boost the, the SME sector. Uh, when it comes to creative, uh, the, the creative industry, 
maybe there's some one of our institutions that we have in the department. We I think we maybe maybe you, either you by oversight or you didn't know about it. You know what you call the Kenya Intellectual Property Institute. I don't know that you know about it. Okay. That's no, one of the most important institutes we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, please, yeah, please yeah. tell tell us a bit more about that. A Kenya International Property Institute mm -hmm. is a government institute institute in the Department of uh, Industrial Association, which uh, assists uh, assists the assists and it it, 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 it does with the registration of those co uh, copyrights uh, copyrights uh, and 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 uh, uh, copyrights uh, mainly. So uh, if you can get in touch with them, uh, they can assist very much on the issue of registration of copyrights and. Uh, and 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 uh, and and, and uh, anything, anything to do with any new innovations, they can do it for for and they can help. So I think with those, uh, I think uh, I don't think we need to have any fears about uh, even with the COVID nineteen, we can still pro progress very well because like now I've seen most people are, now are online. If you go in families, people are online always looking at those uh, creative arts online, eh? and uh, it gives them a lot of entertainment. Because like I was telling somebody, mm -hmm. uh, suppose we didn't have telephones. What will people be doing now with this COVID-19? People will have died of stress. But people are now always on the telephone. If you find little children, mothers, fathers, always on the phone. And when they're on the phone, they're watching those creative uh, uh things. And they're not doing anything. Just look at stories or top stories and laughing and chatting and all this. So I believe that with the, even with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we still can, can, can prosper in the area of uh, creative industry. Okay, uh, well, I don't I, know what I've covered, what they wanted him to cover. Yes, but I I'll, believe I'll, I'll just, in, but... yes, I'll just yeah? ask you one more question, which is specific yeah. to the SME environmental sector, because we know that um, from studies yeah. that are done by yourself and also by um, uh, the Bureau of Statistics, that actually yeah. many of these businesses will falter and close because of the shortage of capital, because of a shortage of financing. And this yeah. is one of the things that has been discussed as as a um, uh, basically a risk or a threat for the creative yeah. uh, businesses, creative economy, which is part of this SME environment. I'm just yeah. wondering whether anything specifically has happened mm -hmm. to mitigate this situation, anything specifically in the last two to three years, because I think when you look at the statistics, you'll find that a number of these small businesses are actually resourced from yeah. their own resources or from family and friends. Yeah. And then and then the next level of resourcing, which is very small, about 15% is the SACOs. So yeah. I'm just asking whether in the last two to three years, this situation of financing the SME mm -hmm. sector, of which the creative economy is, is, is a part of, whether yep. anything has changed there, whether that continues to be a risk for us. Well, it continues to be a risk for us, but where the government is trying, uh, the, 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 it's trying to make sure that uh, the, 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 envir the environment is... Uh, trying to make sure that it can uh, keep, keep them a conducive environment. And one of the things the government has done so far is the uh, repealing of the interest cap. You know, when the interest capping was there, most of the banks were lending to, were fearing to lend to SMEs. But now recently, uh, this was repealed, and I believe that now money is more available to the SMEs. Another thing which, has, which, which the government has, uh, has done was the enhancement of payment of pending bills. You realize that most of SMEs have been working, doing business with the government, uh, county government and national government, and uh, most sometimes they pay, they have not been paid on time or the late payment, but the government has now enhanced uh, the payment of bending bills to SMEs. Another thing is that uh, the government intends to put up what they call uh, an SME fund, which will uh, take care of the, the, the micro and small uh, enterprises, most of them who are informal. And uh, the, the fourth one is that, uh, and the government also is, is, is trying to put in place a credit guarantee scheme, which I think should be launched on the first of August this month, this year. Uh, this year, and this uh, credit guarantee scheme will enable uh, commercial banks to lend to SMEs at a lower rate than what they have been doing in the past. So, with the coming of the credit guarantee scheme, we believe that most SMEs will now be able to access finances uh, from the commercial banks. Another thing is the amendment of the competition bill, which has also been done, and uh, setting up of warehouses uh, in the free trade zones in the seven countries. So the government also in, in, is also going to put up uh, uh, where, uh, warehouses where, by, where SMEs can now accredit their products 
either in all areas for the, the, the marketing and EC. And the government is doing much, uh, uh, and many things the government is doing. And uh, uh, with the COVID-19, the government is also trying, also trying to do something. The first thing it has done is the stimulus. Uh, the stimulus, uh, uh, economic stimulus uh, package to easy to, to increase liquidity in the, in the circulation so that the SMEs can be able to do business. And the first uh, the economic stimulus package was a VAT, it was a reduction of VAT uh, from 16 to 14%, and the reduction of turnover tax from uh, 3 to 1%. Uh, we believe that this can also assist SMEs uh, by increasing liquidity. Although we know that uh, 79% of the SMEs are informal, but we believe that uh, we we still working on it and see how we can handle this informal, uh, which, which is uh, around 78%. Uh, further than that, the government okay, also that's, still that's has good. to... No, that, yeah, that yeah. is good, Wanafula. We, uh, we will come back to, to look a little bit more in detail around how some of these, yeah. because I think you said that, that of course, there's, there's policy, policy shifts, and now we need to yeah. see how they're implemented. And I think that that yeah. will be the next part of our conversation, to try and see how we can get to some, some concrete yeah. action, some real implementation of some of these things, and some of the yeah. barriers or some of the obstacles to implementation and whether we can clear those. So that will be yeah. a discussion in the, in the second part. But allow me to bring in then now our last two panelists, which is um, uh, who yeah. are Dr. Mshai and uh, Simon. And of course, they will be speaking from the perspective of the practice. And Simon, I'd like to start with you. Um, you, of course, are, are, are um, uh, part of an, an ensemble, a, film, a filmmaker's uh, a cooperative or association that, that is known to be quite successful um, so far. And I'd just like you to, to describe to us the position of Riverwood Ensemble before the lockdown and, and the kind of uh, situation that you're now in because of the economic recession that we're beginning to, to experience. So how are film directors doing now? How are producers doing now? How are actors doing now? But how were they doing before? How were they doing before as well? Simon. If you, you turn on your your mic. Simon, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yes. Yeah, Karibu Simon. Asante. I want to thank this conversation, which is actually very helpful. And again, uh, speaking from an experience point of view and a practice, Revolve and Symbol has over the time been getting innovative creating ways of getting their content outside uh, to its consumers. Uh, if you can remember from our initial conversation two years ago, we were speaking about how do we get our content out to producers, uh, not to the producers, how do producers get their content out to the audiences? And if you can remember in the very first initial steps, we were doing a lot of DVDs and DCDs distribution. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, I, I, yeah, I can hear you. I'm just holding this in my ear so I can hear you clearly. Please continue. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then. So over the time, uh, we've been changing how content is being distributed. And we've seen a growth, a great way by getting content on TVs. And then right now we've been trying to uh, innovate and come up with new concepts and ideas of getting our content out. Uh, before COVID, we were trying to create policies. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, Simon, I think you've dropped out a little bit. Simon, can you hear us? Uh, Simon? Hello. content being on among us, the panelists, where we are discussing. I uh, Simon, we lost you a little bit because your internet is buffering. Uh, I'm proposing that he tried by switching off the video to see if we can improve. Uh, Simon, can we, yeah, can you try that? His video is off. Okay, Simon, let's give so, it another sorry? go. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? We can hear you now. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, you please, yeah, please continue. All right, and I was talking about getting, we were part of the Rebound Ensemble 
our initial concept was to create capacity whereby we are stepping out from amateur to professional producers. Mm -hmm. And we've actually seen a gradual transition whereby producers have been doing content on a, on a, VG, on a village level and now getting opportunities on mainstream, getting even commissioning deals, whereby they are, they are signed up to, let's say, two or three years contract of producing a long learning TV series. Uh, the main challenges of now is the changing of times, whereby people no longer sit down to watch content on TVs, because we are spending a lot of time on our gadgets. So, and that, that's a space, that's a new, that's now the new norm, whereby if you have content that can be uploaded on a Facebook or maybe YouTube channel, how do you now start making money out of that content? And I think mm -hmm. right now it's been on a research level to understand how Facebook works. Mm -hmm. You see now that's the new market. We no longer mm -hmm. rely on our primary market, which used to be getting content out on, on screens, because mm -hmm. uh, we no longer have active cinemas. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we leverage on the digital space? And I think that's, that's one of, it's been an uphill task, uh, but I, I think we are we're still hopeful and most probably we'll, we'll get somewhere in the, in the near future. Mm. Of course, COVID has slowed down uh, our, our sector in terms of how, how we get leverage, but as well as creatives. Most of the times I've gotten myself in a situation whereby I'm covering footage for TVs, for TVs uh, uh, or even musicians doing the live coverage yeah. on their, their site. Mm -hmm. But it's a full opportunity, even changing with the changing times. Mm. No, thank you, thank you, Simon. I think that's very clear, and I think you 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 reiterate what came up in the second resilient, which is that as creatives now uh, are forced, as in fact all of us are forced to operate through the digital space. Um, when it comes to the question of monetizing or using that space to market, to make money, to earn a livelihood, of course we are now experiencing certain challenges. And, and, and I hope that we can discuss those a little bit more um, in, in, in the second half of, of this discussion, which is about to, to begin shortly after, after we hear from um, uh, Dr. Mshai Mwangola. So Mshai, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, great. So Mshai, you have been, um, thank you for being patient. We are getting through to all of the, all of the um, panelists to be able to make some remarks around where they saw us just before COVID and the sort of successes or challenges that we've had in the last two, three years. So you've of course been engaged um, uh, variously with adv advocacy efforts in the, in the creative sector. And, uh, and one of the networks that you've been actively engaging through of course is the Creative Economy Working Group who are a partner in this particular resilient um, uh, forum. Uh, now, I think my question to you is really which ways you've seen advocacy begin to make a difference in strengthening the creative sector over the last two to three years um, do you think that we have been able to, to shore up the robustment, uh, robustness of the sector through this work? Um, so what gains do you see made? But also the same question to everybody else, what risks do you see um, at this time of the pandemic? Okay. Thank you very much, Joy. And it certainly was not uh, any kind of a hardship to listen because I've already <laughs> learned so much. Just It was so rich what everybody was saying. I forgot I was a panelist and just started taking notes. <laughs> So I just want to thank all the panelists. I think um, for us um, in the run-up, one of the things for me that's been most exciting has been to see more and more people enter into the advocacy space, especially practitioners. Because I think for a long time, um, there was a reliance on, on public servants to do that work. And, and where people were working, um, it was individuals probably working on one bill because you know this affects your subsector. And so I think the first thing that I think we have seen and that's been very exciting is to see um, people starting to work together across the subsectors. Mm -hmm. So for example, the Creative Economy Working Group, which I'm a part of and which is one of the co-sponsors, brings together institutions and individuals working in different areas of the subsector, uh, different areas of the creative economy. And I think there are two advantages to this. One is that we are all learning a whole lot more from each other. So that rather than just you know, focusing on our own little areas and only being concerned about what is happening there, we're beginning to learn about what's happening in other sectors, uh, in other areas of the subsectors. And I think that's very useful. One, because we're beginning to see 
how many of the issues are actually replicated across. So instead of saying I, we are fighting as theater artists, which is when I started in advocacy several decades ago, we used to see ourselves only as theater artists have a problem, right? That we are working. Now, when I hear something's happening in film or I hear something's working, uh, happening in the visual arts, I'm, I'm deeply invested. The second thing is we are able to consolidate our energies. So uh, for instance, when there was, um, um, a couple of years back when there was the whole engagement around the uh, CAP 222, looking and now starting to re-engage with CAP 222 and coming up with reforming CAP 222, it wasn't just people in the film um, industry who got involved. I, for instance, I was asked to help with the committee that was set up. Now, I'm not a film person by any stretch of the imagination, but they asked me, can you come along and and I think that kind of working together right now when we are looking at um, action in court, for instance, on the question of freedom of expression, which specifically seems to be geared in terms of what's going on within the film sector, several other of us are, are, are engaged. I think that's very useful. Secondly, I think the other good thing that has happened is to see that it's no longer just Nairobi centered. So now, especially with the whole question of culture being devolved to the counties and having shared functions, you're beginning to hear and see, um, make it's really visible that artists and people working in the creative sector from all over the country are not only getting engaged in the conversations, but sometimes are leading the conversations. And I think that's, that's really, really useful and something that needs to be um, um, grown. And then the third thing for me is to see many more younger people engaging. I think what we used to see happening was that people would get to a certain place, right? You, you come in and your first 10 years, all you're doing is doing your own work. And then you, you waited until you started Kuiva. You're in your 40s and 50s and 60s before people really started to engage in the policy and advocacy landscape. A lot of the other earlier action with younger people was activism. So you're out there, you're making noise, you're complaining, you're always protesting, but you're never engaged in the area of advocacy. Now we're beginning to see younger artists, people who are in their early careers, getting really engaged. And I think that's very exciting to see. So I think um, those different areas of people, of a range of people. Um, I think the fourth area I'll quickly also talk about is the way people are engaging, are seeing what's happening in the creative sector as part of a larger, of the larger concerns of the nation. And I think the very good example that was given is um, when we start to see how the creative economy has an impact on the economy of Kenya, where we begin to see how the livelihoods of artists actually is speaking to the wider issues of unemployment in the country, with the wider issues of sustainable, um, creating sustainable income for Kenyan families all across the country. And I think that's a really um, important and, and wonderful thing that is happening. Well, oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Mshai, for sharing that. And in fact, I think that if, if one is to look at um, what all of the panelists have shared so far in terms of, of where we were at before, before uh, COVID, it seems that we, we are looking at a, 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 a sector or a, a subsector that we can actually be very confident about. Yes. Um, I think that if I pick up from, from what you were saying, Mushai, that from, from within the sector, um, it's a sector that has actually began to pull together, um, to draw on its, its and consolidate its, its, the power of its collective efficacy. Um, it's a sector that is not just speaking to the capital, but speaking nationally um, mm -hmm. and trying to impact through advocacy nationally. It's a sector that is also cross-generational, um, that the actors who are pushing for issues of the sector are not just people who, who have been at slogging away, you know, as, as sector practitioners, but also younger generations coming up. And then I think that when we speak, when we hear from those who are outside of the sector, but still connected, um, again, to repeat what Bwana Mushiria said, which is that you see a sector that actually is growing much faster than, than, the, than the main economy, if one does a comparison. Um, and then also when you look at the policy space, if we listen to what um, Bwana Sige and, uh, and Bwana Wafula have been saying is that, of course, there've been a number of reforms that have been instituted in the area of IP, but also in the area of, um, of um, SMEs. And I think the question now is, is how, do we, how do we make sure that these are implemented? And, and to repeat what was said at the beginning, how do we do this within the time of COVID, even as we project for resilience coming outside of COVID? 
But I think that Simon has also pointed to something that is important, which is, and again, as, as I've said, has been uh, mentioned before at another forum of Resiliat, which is now that we're all going online, even though it seems as though there's a lot of opportunity because of the online, there are some real challenges around how do you monetize in the online space? And then I think things that Liz raised and responded to which somebody asked, which is the infringement that now happens with the online space and how do we become innovative in beginning to flag that, that, that our creativity is infringed in some way and, 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 um, and, 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 these, and these issues that are, that are coming up. So wonderful. So I think we have the, the, the panel has been able to bring us to a place where, where we have a sense of the sector from different directions um, of how it was faring uh, before we got to this moment of COVID, which we don't know how long it will take. Yeah, we don't know how long we will be within the, the, the period of the pandemic. So let's now look at some concrete recommendations and possibilities from the perspective of the panelists who are here, but also from the attendees. So I'd encourage those who are listening um, in to also make a comment on the side and, and we will try and be as efficient as possible in bringing those into the conversation. And one of the comments, of course, if, if I can lead in with that, uh, just so that I don't, I don't forget it, is somebody called Joseph O'Bell who says that he is um, uh, an arts events curator and a theater director. And before COVID things were better, uh, but right now, of course, it's really hard. And he's saying that he's been trying to apply for emergency funds. So emergency funds that have been available for, for the sector, but has not been successful. And so he's asking, is there a better way to sell his work to be able to survive at this lockdown moment? Now, I'm not expecting that you will respond to that directly, but Mshai, I will lead on with you um, to just sort of say that as we now look at sort of concrete, um, some concrete steps, some concrete recommendations that can be made. One of the things that we know has happened for the sector, which was um, unprecedented, is really the 100 million shilling stimulus that um, was provided uh, by, by the Ministry of Culture, by the government. Um, and I, I suspect that Joseph Obel is probably responding to, to not being able to access this kind of emergency fund as an artist. I want to sort of ask Mshai that what lesson do you think we can take from just this, if I can call it experiment of grant dispersal by the ministry? What can we learn from this? And then to connect this to what we know is as a vehicle that already exists, which is the sports and arts fund, that again, we know is beyond the reach of, of the arts sector at this time. What are some of your own thoughts around how we can begin to operationalize this fund, the sports and arts fund, so that it works more effectively and equitably for the benefit of the creative sector, but also a response to the stimulus. Is this something that you think, are there lessons that we can learn to carry forward a grant making between um, government and the sector for the future? Yes. Thank you very much, Joy. And, and, and before I say that, I just want to quickly, like it's been wonderful in some ways for the sector, but I think four things, and I'm just gonna say this very quickly, where we see the risk. And, and I think this whole area of what happened with this, with this stimulus package really mm -hmm. amplified this. I think the four things was number one product that um, mm -hmm. what we saw happening is that not all artistic areas were covered, right? And if you didn't have a product that you could translate and, and the digital space is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But if you're working with craft and you you know you're 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 not necessarily able to quickly upscale and send things abroad and do things like that, for some people it was a real struggle. If your thing is live theater, and I'm from live theater, yes, I can upload stuff and put it online, but not everybody has access to it. Not every artist can do that, not everybody um can can consume that. And so some people said my audiences who know me can't reach out to me. So there was the problem of product, it didn't get to everybody. And the mm -hmm. Way the stimulus fund was structured a lot of the offerings said get for instance in theater upload your work online and then mm -hmm. when you're going to come and we're going to shoot it and we're going to and so many theater artists said okay i can do that but then that loses the live nature of it the second one was in terms of people and one of the very big complaints that came up and i think you will remember that actually in many cases they had to extend the period was mm -hmm. because so many people did not have could not get access number one 
they were not able to know when what to do when to come where to upload stuff where to download stuff so the stimulus package left out i think the bulk of the artists especially those who are not centered in urban areas especially those who did not have access to certain technology so the third thing was that and i think what happened is that it further marginalized those who had a lot um, to, to them who had a lot more was given <laughs> and to they who had little it was take even that little seemed to be taken away the mm. third thing was the process and i think we really it, it 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 made very clear that the question of public participation is not just a question of rubber stamping and so for me what this process began to to uplift and i'm really happy that it happened was number one the need for us to build in this question of the people who are most invested, the people who will be the biggest beneficiaries, being able to be part of the process right from the space of conceptualization. Mm -hmm. I think if we had sat down and, and the government had said, look, this there is a fund. First of all, let's start there. Many artists did not even know that there was that there is a sports art and social development fund many people did not know that this fund gives grants right and even before the whole covid season came there was no engagement on it when it came many people did not know what are we eligible for and what are we not eligible for and so you had things for example of it's about entertainment well not all the arts are about entertainment it's about being patriotic and then later on as we began to engage many of the institutions said you don't have to be patriotic in the sense of celebration because that's how it was translated mm -hmm. uh, many people did not know okay you've told us to submit who is judging? What is the judging process? Do we get feedback? If I fail the first time, will there be another opportunity to upload? That, you know, all those processes were not clear. Mm -hmm. For me, I think in terms of recommendations and where I think we could have learned, we can learn a lot from, mm -hmm. is number one, structuring um, who gets this money and how the grants are given so that it's not only about product, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole program was in fact called work for pay you know we're paying you because you have produced mm -hmm. and that that seemed to suggest that the only time that work is done is where an artistic product is available but here are some of the areas i think that we could have done some really good work put money aside for training and skills development many artists are always so busy with having to produce and for example, if some of the grant money was made available to institutions or to individuals who are able to offer workshops, so give us a proposal, we will give you 10 people and we will pay for all the training that goes in. And the training could be artistic, right? So you could say, we have young musicians who would benefit from working with somebody to mentor them over a 10 week process. Or it could be professional development. I've had amazing things from Liz today. I've had amazing things in terms of um, um, what we may need to learn about SME. You know, I, I have a small business. I don't know how to grow it. I need to get financial advice. Where do I go? If some of that money had gone into that, and it's very easy to, 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 to figure out. You pay the money to the institution. The money does go to the artist, but they get, and we're also encouraging people to focus on skills development or focus on how they can build the capacity of their businesses. Mm -hmm. Another area that money could have gone into is research. Artists are always having to research their work. And for people who are not able to create actively during, I mean, to, 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 to do some work actively in terms of artistic product right now, investing in those early areas of research. So give me money that allows me to go into onto online libraries or research in whatever way I need to do it. A third way that I think we could have um, um, dealt with is um, figuring out how to fund policy processes. How many young artists do not know the laws that govern the industries that they work with or think it's only, you know, if it's film, is there a film bill? If there's no film act, if they, you know, then I don't have to engage. But even just now when, uh, when Afula was talking about, he gave us a whole range of, of public policy, of legislation, of institutions, of places that people can go to learn. And so even um, putting some of that money in those institutions to allow them 
to have all sorts of engagement processes, I think would have been very useful. So I think that the, the, the putting into product was a wonderful place to begin, but I think investing in more than just product. And then the third area that I think we could have um, really put um, some money into is investing in the creative process, right? In telling people there will be money for you to create and you you know we can figure out what the evidence of that will be but if somebody is quote playing in the positive sense is experimenting is trying things and it doesn't always result in a product that is still work if somebody needs some money to sit down and just write or just paint and you know it may not necessarily become a book that can be sent out in the next two or three months. It might result in a book that will come out two years from now. But many young people do not have the luxury just to sit at home and research and write or paint or things like that. So I think that for me, one of the biggest lessons was one, consult with the practitioners, find out what they really need and then put the money into that. Number two, use the time to get more people invested in, in policy processes. If people understand what the policy is and then teaching them, this is what the policy pro process looks like. Here is where different people can engage. Here is how, if you don't have the skills. It took me six years at the Kenya Cultural Center to begin to fully understand the policy places. And it was because I, I got invited onto the governing council and then I had to learn how to do it. Well, what if we just spent the time, this moment, in, in allowing ourselves the skills, in learning the skills, in educating ourselves, in building the networks? So I think for me, the number one lesson with the Sports Arts and Development Fund was we could have used the space to, to just think through the many ways that the creative sector works, think through where the gap areas are, build the capacity of different people and most of all get the public servants who are at the sports art and development sector uh, social development fund to truly engage with the practitioners in saying this is how we spent five percent of the fund last year in your area was this the best use of the funds how else could we do it what frameworks would make the work more manifest what frameworks would make the work more visible I was struck joy by the fact that so many artists did not know that 5% of 8 billion shillings was spent in the art sector in the last year. We didn't know that the money was there. We didn't know what it was used for. We had no ways of, of checking on accountability frameworks so that we could plan going ahead. So I guess for me, it, the, that, that stimulus package, the government said, we'll give you 100 million shillings, became an opportunity to realize that there is money for the art sector. It's money that belongs to us as a right, but the frameworks do not exist for us to actually make good use of it. And all these are different ways in which we can continue to use the money, not even the 100 million, that money is, is there, but then the bigger, the five to 20% that the sector will be getting from the sports arts and development fund money every year to begin to actually um, engage with the frameworks that will make that money do the work it, it needs to do. No, thank you very much, Mshai. I mean, you've said you've said a lot, and but I think the, the primary thing that you're saying there moving forward, the recommendation is that this experience of sort of a grant exchange between the government and the sector is one that 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 showed that this that the, the, the at least from the perspective of the ministry, attention was only being given to the product, and that now there's an opportunity to look at granting and developing and building the wider sector through looking at things like training, through looking at things like the creative process, through looking at things like the policy questions and, and a whole host of other things. So in other words, in the same way that the sector has been benefiting from funding and, and unfortunately often external funding that looks at us in that way, that begins to bring money that can be for training, that can be advocacy, that can be for creative processes, that maybe now from internally as well, we begin to recognize that our, our granting and our funding needs to expand to, to that as well. And of and course, that you've mentioned, that, and you've mentioned a whole host of other things as well, which are the yeah. frameworks to be able to, to do this. And I wanted to say, I think the frameworks are really important. Absolutely. This is what the money can be used for, but here I make visible the way Kekobo did in, in, in setting up the money that they got from the copyright. They put in place frameworks that are visible and people know how to access. That's right. 
No, absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you. So Buonasigue, I will jump to you and to Liz, because the other thing, of course, that um, has been mentioned by, by Mshai, and which was a question that I was going to put to you anyway, is, is the challenge of the online. And the challenge of the online from the perspective of, of the question of, of, of rights and the infringement of rights. Um, mm -hmm. I know that uh, Buonasigue, you did have, I think you had two pieces in the newspaper, um, if, if not more, but at least certainly one or two that I saw. Um, where you were, you were reminding people that this um, downloading of, of, of newspapers and sharing is um, infringing on the copyright of, of, um, of, of, of um, those, those uh, owners of, of the newspapers. But then I also know that there was a small run in with the DJs when the DJs also went online to, um, to try and keep earning a livelihood, you know, by playing sets online, etc. And of course, there was a whole issue of copyright. Um, just give us your perspective on some of the some your, your sense of some of these issues that are now of course becoming more apparent as we will work and live online moving forward and some recommendations around a way forward for the sector on how we can begin to to tackle these things look at them i know that liz gave an excellent example when she was responding to the young lady who was talking about her visual arts work but more generally what is your sense and i'll ask liz the same question around how we can begin to resolve these questions that are emerging because we are going digital? For me, I consider digital to be an opportunity, a big opportunity. We've been trying for many years to ask uh, that uh, the sector to get prepared and, um, and uh, ensure that they are ready with the skills and the technology mm -hmm. necessary for making money online. One of the, therefore for me, uh, one of the benefits of this uh, pandemic is that people have been forced to adjust into the digital trading environment. Um, maybe before time, if we had not had pandemic, we would probably not be discussing uh, uh, online as a, as a marketplace. Mm -hmm. So we, we've been forced and that, that is a benefit that I hope will be sustained. But having said that, um, it requires a lot of uh, work on the side of government and people working within the sector to ensure uh, readiness uh, among the people working here to make money because they are also very uh, real, damage that can happen to your products uh, online as indicated already. So for me, uh, awareness is very key. To, we, need to, we need people to learn, adjust, get comfortable and adapt to the digital environment. The skills required here are uh, limited um, skills in the in area of uh, ICT. It's usually equipment, it's a website, e-commerce website, uh, ability to receive payment, uh, ability to restrict uh, access, and, uh, and uh, ability to copy uh, all the people who have access to your work, ability to follow uh, how your work is used online. And it's not as hard as it sounds. Uh, so we need people to get ready and get organized. YouTube is a big opportunity. Many artists keep complaining. I keep telling them the first thing you need to do is to know how to take down. Uh, after you've taken down, then you can follow up and ensure that your work is, that you, present, you, you upload. is work that cannot be easily copied or manipulated. And um, so they, they, a lot of as um, artists have been uh, ours to to join in this this area. Just like all of us uh, mm. are, are not ready for change. Mm. So the in terms of uh, I think we've made our legislation ready and uh, well, um, and uh, useful for this arena. The changes made in the copyright amendment bill made us made it possible for people now to. Uh, intervene and have their works, uh, the access to their works uh, that are available online removed 
or uh, blocked by the internet service provider. It's still early stages on how the impact would be, but uh, at least on the um, structural side, we provided a capacity and a framework for the purposes of tech now. Mm -hmm. um, what we realized a few years ago is that there are limited e-commerce platforms that are being developed with the uh, with the a Kenyan artist in mind. Mm -hmm. So our, our reliance on um, international platforms is a risk that we should uh, try and uh, mitigate. Mm -hmm. So that, um, and we need to tell artists that right now, as we speak, even piracy in the online, in the analog environment is disappearing. Mm -hmm. Everything is going online. So this is a new marketplace. Uh, we did a survey a few, several years ago, and we realized that the cost of setting up for many, they found it very, uh, setting up some of these sites are very high. Mm. And the conclusion from that uh, study said that um, the government should work with the private sector to create uh, platforms for artists in Kenya. Otherwise, we'll be very much uh, locked out. But uh, I wanted also to provide a context within uh, about the DJs. <clears throat> Uh, the DJs uh, wanted to avoid paying the collective management organization the licensing fees. And uh, in some occasions, they were using works of uh, artists that they had not been able to obtain uh, approvals from. <clears throat> and for that reason, they were being taken down uh, by the, the, the platforms that they were using because of the rules and regulations that have been set up there. Uh, some people wrongly then uh, said we were the ones who are responsible for the tech uh, being blocked or uh, brought down by the, those uh, platforms like Facebook or Instagram or others. But they were actually a breach of the regulations in those areas. Uh, so for me, um, this is a good opportunity. We have been forced into it. The media were not ready. The, they quickly then uh, made, uh, uh, they created new frameworks, paywalls and stuff. And then people, the, the problem disappeared. Yeah. So, <laughs> so while uh, we, we had work to do for them to, mm. to be able to, uh, to shield them for a while, mm. Mm. now the, they are becoming innovative. Innovation is an all innovation. Somebody spoke about innovation. Mm. We, we innovate best in uh, under peril or threat. Mm. But, and that's what happened. The media was, was one of the most uh, analog uh, places. <laughs> no, so that's we, right. Yeah, so they, they, are, they are getting in. Uh, they, they are, many people didn't know anything about the internet. That's why there are a lot of complaints are coming in about YouTube because people are discovering, oh, there's a marketplace that uh, we have never known could give tap. us some income. Okay. Or, uh, yeah, no, great, know. great. Yeah. Okay, no, so, thank you, thank you. No, that's good. So I'll, I'll allow Liz and um, and actually Bonawa Fula to come in because the next point I think speaks to Liz, speaks to the digital in some sense, but it also speaks to the idea of the kind of um, uh, mitigative measures that, that government has offered and can continue to offer perhaps to the sector. And this one is just um, continuing from this discussion on, of the online. One of the things we know is a proposal, and again, the creative sector has been asking questions around this, is the proposal of the one, uh, one point, one and a half percent um, uh, digital tax, uh, that as we go online, then now how do we begin to tax uh, businesses um, that are going online? I'm just wondering, Wananyungesa, from your perspective, and also Liz, I will, I will put the question to you first, but at what point do you begin to, to, to tax something? You know, because, because there is a moment of acceleration onto the digital, if a sector is still young, if a sector is still nascent, how do you, how do you think we should craft uh, these sorts of measures that government of course needs to take in order to also be able to generate revenue without hurting sectors that are still growing? 
So if you look at taxing a Google or a Facebook, it's very different than taxing a young artist who is trying to put their work online. Um, so, so how do we, what, what, is, your, what is your thinking, uh, Liz, around, first of all, digital tax uh, for, for the creatives online? And then Juan Nyongesa to respond to the same question, but to also talk about tax mitigation for the SME sector more generally. Liz. Okay, um, so I'll comment and say that in, in my view, um, mm -hmm. the, 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 the digital tax was a misconception in terms of uh, they view uh, internet as a business setting instead of infrastructure to facilitate um, mm -hmm. the trade. Because already um, when you look at SMEs and businesses in, in general, uh, they already have licenses that they take out. And then depending on also uh, what kind of business you are, you're subject to certain taxes, if it's VAT, if it's income tax, you know, all that stuff. Um, so in my view, the approach was a little, um, ill-advised uh, mm -hmm. so as such then it means that you know the SMEs are paying taxes left right and center right now uh, the conversation is how are we going to implement this digital tax at the end mm -hmm. of the day it will also be imposed on the consumer which then means that all these uh, creative arts and entertainment products are going to suffer even further which means you know even the consumers will be like okay if, if they're going to tax uh, you know access to content um, and, and especially from my end as a consumer uh, if they're going to tax me for buying some something through Facebook instead of going directly to uh, a shop, then, you know, for, for what use is it? So I think it was a little ill-advised. And of course, the execution is going to be very uh, painstaking uh, mm. because ideally it's supposed to be based on the business itself. But if it's a small business, how are they going to sustain themselves? If they transfer it to the consumer, then the consumer will walk away. It's just a catch-22 situation. So I think mm. we need to, to just we need to really rethink. I, 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 it is our prayer that Kerry would even rethink it and, and see internet as infrastructure as opposed as as opposed to a new entity, a business entity, which is how they have tackled this, the whole situation. Mm -hmm. So, Bueno Fuller, to put the, the, the you know, the, to extend that question to you now, I, I know one of the things, of course, that you're concerned about is to try and see how these small and medium sized and micro businesses thrive. And um, of course, one of the reliefs that government has given is the reduction of VAT from 16 to 14. So my question is, is this really making an impact, 16 to 14? Um, do you have evidence that it is making a difference? And then thinking ahead, again, should we, in order to help these businesses um, survive and develop and become large corporations, should we, for the long term, beyond COVID, Think about different regimes, different tax regimes for, for small businesses, for micro businesses, such as those in the creative economy. Okay, uh, I hope you, you, you hear me. Yes, yes, we do. Thank you. Yeah, uh, one thing uh, from my point of view, mm -hmm. I, I believe that business should, not, should never be controlled. When the business is controlled so much, it can't prosper. Look at the mobile sector, mobile phone sector when it came in, in, in Kenya. There was no control over it for a long time. So that it prospered so much because there was no control. Taxation of the of the mobile uh, uh, services came in later, but uh, from the beginning it was not there. So the the, the 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 mobile sector prospered so fast because there was no government control, there was no taxation until it was established. The taxation came in. So my view is about is that uh, the, the the issues that should, should, they should be the taxation should be minimal as much as possible, so that the business grows up. But once it grows up, then it can be taxed. Now, something else I want to say about the same is that uh, when, when we talk about taxation, we usually point our finger to KRA. Mm. By the way, KRA, they, they have nothing to do with taxation. The KRA, they do what they have been told to do. So what you should point our finger to is the parliament, which passes acts on taxation. Mm -hmm. So we cannot point our finger to KRA. If you go to KRA and ask them, why are you taxing us? They say, yeah, I was given the authority to tax you. So the the, the, the the big thing, let us focus where the problem comes from. Let us focus on the on, the, on, our, on our members of parliament. I don't know whether I don't know whether the parliament is any 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 committee which handles um, a creative uh, industry. If there is a committee, that's a committee you should, should follow up on the issue of the accession. because the KRA do what they've been started by parliament. Once and allows pass for taxation, they'll do it, and they'll do it mercilessly in that sphere because they have been authorized to do it. So let's focus the, the, at the right point where we're going to be able to help our SMEs, especially the young ones, not, not be taxed. Right. No, That's my you. view. 
Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. And I'll ask Simon to actually now make a comment really as a practitioner and somebody who represents practitioners around how, what is the impact of, of tax or even tax relief actually. Does, mm. These reliefs that government gave um, in yeah. terms of reducing the turnover tax, in terms of reducing the VAT, did, yeah. did, that, did that reach you? Did you feel the effect of that? Did that help? Um, the, the stimulus itself, which um, Mushai has spoken, has spoken extensively about, did yeah. members of the Riverwood Ensemble benefit from it? So that we can understand from your perspective, what is a recommendation around making sure that these measures that are supposed to mitigate and bring relief actually do have that, that, that intended effect. So what was the effect from your perspective? Uh, from my perspective, perspective the, the tax relief, I don't have so I don't have so much because uh SMEs oh, so is that one and you guess of one Maura. Oh sorry. Who is speaking? Oh sorry. It? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, yeah, I was I was I was, I was uh, putting that to Bona Maura, Simon. Yes. Sorry, sorry. And then and then Bona you guess you can add to that, but uh, let's let's hear Simon first. Yeah. Uh the the issue of taxation uh, I'm really not conversant with it for now. I'll, I'll I'll be that's a gray area for my side. But speaking of the stimulus program whereby the government through the Kenya Film Commission was able to, to caution some producers with uh, funding for their projects, which was very positive uh, and impactful to some of our mm. producers. And then I'll also contribute about the capacity building because over the, over the couple of years, let's say like three, three years ago, I think also the commission has been doing capacity building whereby they've been going to counties uh, and offering capacity building sessions to most of our producers, which has also actually given growth to skill set, whereby you're getting also producers getting commissioning on TVs on mainstream, which is a good thing for that. Mm -hmm. Then the recommendation from our side, I think, will be uh, getting having a Kenyan screening culture, whereby we're not only competing in the international content, but we're also encouraging our citizens to keep Kenyan. And no matter how probably we might also discuss the issues of quality, low quality, but if they are seeing it more often, uh, most probably quality as well will increase with time. Okay, okay, no, yeah. thank you, Simon. And maybe I'll throw it back to Buana Nyongesa just before I get to Buana Mushiri and then we begin to sort of wrap up. I think Simon has said something inter interesting around trying to see how we, how we encourage um, the consumption of, 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 Kenyan, of Kenyan content. Um, so Screen Kenya, I think, is, is, is what you said, which, yes. which raises for me this question around some of these slogans that we use when we're trying to, 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 you know, to push um, a certain measure, buy Kenya, build Kenya. Are these just platitudes? Are these just, is this just rhetoric? How does it become practical? Because I think this buy Kenya, build Kenya is something that we all believe in. But because we don't feel it in terms of the policy or the initiatives or the measures, we begin to disbelieve it. So how do we move from platitude to action in your, in your view, especially in relation to this idea of, of buy Kenya, build Kenya, which as, as um, Mauro has spoken about, would be really supportive of the creative economy, of the products and the work of, of Kenyan creatives at home. Uh, hello, that's Wafula speaking now. Yes, yes, Wafula. Yeah, maybe maybe before I forget uh, about the issue of buy Kenya build Kenya. Yes. Buy Kenya build Kenya is an initiative of government, and we also have what you call a local content policy. Mm. Now this issue of buy Kenya build Kenya is something which should be done, which should be inbuilt among Kenyans. Kenyans have a problem of looking for things from outside the country. Imagine if, when a Kenyan goes to China, for example, for a maybe for a training, he will fill his box with new dresses, new clothes from China. Instead of getting the money and coming to buy the things in Kenya, he will buy from there. It's a common, it's a problem of we Kenyans. So we have to change. We have to, we have to be patriotic and change and love our own culture, love our own, and buy from our own. How do we do that? It's the question. How do we do that? And how particularly can that's your directorate help us? A, a, change of, a change of attitude and a change of culture. I don't know how to be that because even you, you go right from home there where you're born. You want to buy something from uh, somewhere. I want to buy something from Nairobi. I want to buy something from Mombasa. I want to buy something from, from Kakameka, and I come from Bogoma. Because I think Kakameka is superior than Bogoma. You see that? So we have a problem of, uh, I think they call it the inferiority complex. Eh? You think that our own is not the best. So that one should be, uh, 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 should be an issue of ideology change and uh, 
and, 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 and the attitude change. But we just know that ours is also good. That's, that's on the issue of the why can you build Kenya? We have even a policy called the local content policy where, where we're encouraging. Like, like even now in the government, or in the government uh, procurement, we encourage that most of it comes from Kenya. So that's about the the, 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 the policy. And the other point I wanted to speak about was, uh, what was it? Maybe you reminded me. The other yeah, point no, was so, what? Yeah, no, I was just sort of saying, I think you've made the point. I was asking how we move from buy Kenya, build Kenya, being merely a rhetorical statement to something yeah. that is, is concrete. And I think you have responded to that by saying that a mindset needs to change. You need to change. Yeah. Okay, no, you and know, and again, you. on the SME, on the SME, the, the, on the stimulus, huh? Yes. And the stimulus, my comment on the stimulus, actually, most of the SMEs are not, are not going to benefit because, uh, we, as we said earlier, uh, seventy-nine percent of SMEs are informal, so they, they may not benefit from the stimulus the government is putting ahead. I, I think the government should go further than that; should go further and target these SMEs who are not who are not uh, who are informal. Because for and informal what is and, and I'm sure you have some thoughts around how that might happen. How do we reach the so-called informality? How do we reach that informal sector? It means we have to go out of our way and maybe, and maybe work with the NGOs, uh, with faith-based organizations uh, at, at the grassroots level. So they can be able to, to, to maybe put funds in those, in those NGOs and maybe faith-based organizations and other uh, local uh, uh, CBOs. We're going to be able to get to them because if we do just a uh, general stimulus uh, in taxation, we will not reach them. Mm -hmm. no, That's my, you, my thank yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mshai. I think you wanted to make um, an intervention, please. Thank you, Joy. I just wanted to say, I think, um, and, and into it, the, the, the point, the question of how do we make Kenyans embrace it? I think one of the problems that we've had is that we've, we've divorced the creative economy and the creative sector from the question of Kenya, you know, and from mm. the question of, it's not just what is good for the sector, it is what is good for the country. Mm. Article 11 of our constitution says that culture is the foundation of the nation. We haven't seriously engaged on what that means and what the link to the creative sector is. And the creative sector is much more important than what it contributes to the economy. That's very critical. And indeed, as we have already, dis um, we've already heard from the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, what happens in the creative economy has got a relationship to the economy of the country. But beyond mm -hmm. that, the creative sector is very critical in terms of being the ones that hold together the culture, the mm -hmm. cultural and the creative sector as the foundation of the nation. When we really begin to understand that when we build the creative sector, when we build the cultural sector, we are building the foundation of the nation, then we can begin to engage that question so that we've got to take this away from one sector into the nation. And I think when we do that, I've just seen somebody has commented that you know, um, Kenyan goods are too, they're too expensive. When you look at the cost compared mm -hmm. to what we're buying from say China or wherever else. Mm -hmm. But when we begin to, um, link that to education and we begin to link that to what is this doing for who we are as our nation when we begin to link that to the values not in the cheap way of just say let's celebrate but in saying how does this help us instill article 10 values into the nation then the value of the creative sector and the value of the cultural sector and the value of culture being the foundation of the nation becomes much bigger than a fringe part of we do when we have money to get to, it becomes central to everything that we do. And I think that's what we need to do as Kenyans. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mishai, for re-anchoring that again, of course, in, 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 the, in that very powerful statement of the constitution, which says that culture is indeed the foundation of the nation. So the nation is made and built on culture. Yeah, no, thank you. Now, before we get to something which is different for, in this resiliat is that we have two poll questions, which we will ask, uh, the attendees and the panelists to respond to. I just want to give uh, Bwana Mushiri a chance to also um, give us a way forward um, in relation to where he operates from, which is statistics. Bwana Mushiri, you indicated that, of course, as we as you look at statistics, it straddles many subsectors of the of the bigger economy, and that um, the creative economy, so far, if we were to if we were to measure it, we would be putting together two two um, lines of measurement that you have 
when you're when you're when you're measuring the GDP, and that was the arts, entertainment, and recreation line, and also the the um, information and communication line. But you indicated, of course, that it is you can probably find it in tourism. You can find it in many other places. My question is, when you are looking to measure the creative economy, what are you looking at? What are you looking for? And how can the sector itself make this work easier for you? So moving forward, how can we be a better partner to the Bureau of Statistics in making the measurement of the creative economy easier for the creative economy? So separate from the question that, um, that Sigay also asked, which was how do we also disaggregate it completely so that we have a line that measures the creative economy quite distinctly. So what are you measuring? What are you looking at? And how can we be a better partner to you in making that work easier? as a creative sector. Thank you, Yes, yes. thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, and I want to thank the panelists. I'm, I'm also coming out more educated and um, understanding the sector better than I was before. I think the starting point in terms of uh, improving the statistics for the creative sector economy is uh, the definition. Yes, I agree with Sigay uh, that uh, they are working definitions at the moment because you look at UNCTAD, there is uh, the definition. UNESCO also has a definition for it. And when you look at the best practices in terms of the countries that are doing very well in uh, creative economy, you can give examples of UK, you can look at uh, Australia, but all these, there are some similarities. There is a common denominator as to the definition of creative economy, but still there are some disparities here and there. And then um, the, what I know about uh, international definitions, you have to come down and domesticate. So we could be having a handbook from UNCTAD about the measurement of creative economy, but as Kenyans, we need to sit down and uh, make it work for the Kenyan case. So I still feel that uh, there is need for us as Kenyans to define what is it that we are going to be calling our creative industry. And most probably, we, we are not reinventing the wheel. It's most probably going to be borrowing best practices. And the recommendations by ANCAR, any all those international organizations. But we can come together and craft a working definition for the Kenyan case that is still comparable with the international, with the international, within the international arena. Then, uh, there is the C, the Creative Economy Technical Working Group. I think they need to engage us more. If it cannot bust, if we have a member from the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, I think it would be good to have a member because I think um, the, the work of the government is to create an environment for the private sector to thrive. And I'm happy to hear that there is already a technical working group but I think it would be good for us to either we look for a way of the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics liaising with the technical working group so that we can look at how best can we uh, improve on the statistics. And then um, I know there are two ways. There is what is defined within the central framework of uh, national accounts. And then there is also the recommendation that you can expand. For example, I'll give an example with the tourism. Tourism is not defined within uh, as an industry within the ICIC, but then uh, it is allowed that you do what we call a tourism satellite account. Mm -hmm. Because part of tourism is in hotels and restaurants. There is another one in wholesale and retail, and it's all over transport. We also have a bit of tourism. So the recommendation in statistics is that you pull out all those components and you amalgamate them to come up with what we call the tourism satellite mm -hmm. account. And I think we can do that as Kenyan. Mm -hmm. We can pull out the different components of uh, creative arts from the different uh, sectors. And then we come up with what we are calling the creative arts without necessarily looking at uh, as, as if there is a contradiction within the, 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 the statistics. And I think that is, that is my take. And I also wanted to way in, in terms of build Kenya by Kenyans. Yes, I please. I'm a Kenyan consumer. Yes, and please my do. take is that it takes two to tango. Mm. There is the responsibility of me as a Kenyan. Mm. But I'm a consumer and a rational consumer looks at two items, the pricing and the quality of whatever you are buying. So the first thing that we need as producers in Kenya, 
are we producing something that is of good quality, of good standard to the Kenyans? And what are the prices that we are, what, what is our pricing? And I'm happy because I've seen a number of programs that are being run in Kenyan TV. Before, we used to watch a lot of Niger movies. South, Africa, South American soaps and, and the like. But today, if you go to the TV, any of the channels, at least there is something that they have been able to produce for the Kenyan market that is fairly priced and there is a good mix. But if you listen to music, I think we are tending so, so much to Tanzanian side. We are listening to Harmonize, we are listening to Diamond. I think we need to up our game as musicians, but I'm not saying that we don't have any good musicians. We have many a number, but uh, I think we need more. So it's an issue of us as producers, where do we, do we really understand our market? And uh, if you look at something like Safaricom, why is it doing so much well compared to the others? I, I think they have studied the market and they know whom to. Then I come to the side of the government and I would want them to look at what Japan did for the, in protecting its cottage industry. There are some, industries that are still down there, like the way Nyongesa was saying, that we need to protect them until they are fully grown for them to compete with somebody outside there. So I think we should also, as a government, put some uh, a framework that protects our cottage industry in a way that it's able to stand and be big enough to fight with the brothers, just like the way we do as parents, when the smallest of our child, we, we, we try to protect them from the from the big ones. So that's my take that uh, from the producer side, uh, can they improve on the quality, then they do good pricing so that they can compete with the rest, with the China and whatever. And I, I'm sure it's not that China is producing very good. It's the pricing situation that they, because their prices are very friendly, they are very low. But if you look at the quality, I don't think they are producing something that is so good. Why are we complaining about the Kikomba market when it is closed down? Because Sometimes when I look at the quality of an imported uh, piece of cloth, it's much better than what I can get from the shops. So sometimes people are not going to the Ekomba because they can't afford that. But it's because even if I go to the shops around, I can't get something that is to my taste. And I think simply that is my take about uh, build Kenya, buy Kenya, build okay. Kenya. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And in fact, thank you all to the panelists. I think that um, in your responses, we have we are culling some wonderful recommendations uh, moving forward for, for, for Resiliat and some very concrete things that I know we can continue to do together between the creative sector and the statistics creative sector with the directorate of, um, of um, small and medium sized enterprises and the creative sector, of course, with, with, with Kekobo. Now, I know we are coming, running to the end. We're coming to two hours now. And um, I can see that some panelists are already beginning to walk away. So I'd like to ask Kazita to kindly share with us the, the two poll questions so that at least the 30 odd who are here can respond to those. And then I'll come back to, to wrap up the session by um, asking the panelists to just sort of name one thing, just one thing that you'd prioritize for the sector, for helping to move the sector forward um, at this time and beyond. So just one thing, so not a long sentence, just one thing. It can be one word or one phrase um, after we do this um, uh, poll. So Azita, kindly, if you can share the poll, it will just take about a minute for us to respond to. There they are, it's right up there, two questions. And, and then the results will also come away immediately. So the first question, should the recent Kenya government stimulus program for the creative sector be institutionalized going forward to grow the sector. In other words, in the last discussion we had, this seems to be a one-off um, gesture. So the question here is, should this now be institutionalized? Should it be a part of, of um, processes and practice moving forward to grow the sector? And then the second question is, should the creative sector and the media be self-regulating with regard to the freedom of artistic expression? In other words, they regulate themselves uh, rather than be, that rather than have uh, laws that try to restrict or censor uh, artistic expression. So very quickly, folks, a minute to just click yes or no on either of those, push submit, and let's see what the result is among the small number that we have. And I believe everybody can actually participate. Let me give it a go and see whether I can participate as well. I 
and joy i'm still here just using my husband's account <laughs> and liz no great great yeah fantastic so liz i hope you heard us yes that we at the very end after these results come through i will just ask each panelist to very quickly just say what is the one thing that you'd prioritize so that the recommendation report which you had um judy ogana mm -hmm. mentioned they will be sending forward to the ministry um can capture that and All then right. uh, and then i will invite um uh, someone to close to make some closing remarks oh. so hasita how are we doing with the has everybody responded who, who wishes to respond uh, we'll give them uh, one more minute okay so maybe as we do that maybe as we do that then actually i can ask the moderator uh, the the um panelists to kindly just tell us the one thing that you would prioritize um for the creative sector now that we've all gotten to understand the creative sector a little bit better for those of us who are not directly engaging in it, what would you prioritize during and after COVID um, that you think would be a, a great benefit to the sector? What would you prioritize? So let me um, move in the order in which I introduced the panelists earlier on. So, uh, Buena Sige. Awareness and uh, capacity building. Awareness and capacity building. Yes. In, 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 in the IP space, for the IP space? Not, uh, for, or for just me, generally? I'm, I'm looking at um, this sector as a, an enterprise. Yes. So you, you need skills in from enterprise regulation and, uh, and management. So okay. All, you know, all around it, yes. Okay, a holistic capacity building and awareness. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Dr. Mshai. What would you prioritize? Joy, I'm a storyteller. I don't do one word. I think, <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I, would prioritize. I think going back to that thing of that, we need a national conversation on the place of culture. And we need to understand why this country and ourselves must invest much more in, in, in the creative sector and the cultural sector. Understanding we're frontline workers, understanding the centrality of culture, understanding that investing isn't just money, investing is actually investing in the soul of the nation and not just in one's mm -hmm. No, Wonderful, thank you, thank you. Buona Mushiri. Is Buona Mushiri with us? Yes. Yes, I, I'm still here. Yes. Uh, my priority would be that, uh, like um, standardizing or agreeing, what is it that we are calling creative economy, and then from mm -hmm. there, look at ways of improving uh, mm -hmm. the statistics regarding the uh, the seed. That is mm -hmm. the creative in the, uh, economy. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just passing through a rough patch. <laughs> have we lost Joy? Yeah, I think we may have lost Joy. I thought it was me who had. Oh, no, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Now no, you're I'm you. no, I'm very sorry. It's because the phone rang and I'm using the phone internet. Sorry. Oh. So we were on, yeah, so I thought I was losing everybody, but they were losing me. Simon, kindly, what would you prioritize? My, from my opinion, I would prioritize the statistics that will come along with research. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, because this will actually guarantee that the creatives across the country are doing something. And then the second thing will be funding. Those two. Because I think capacity building is still work ongoing, it's still happening. And then, uh, but funding, it's only that right now we've got the first funding through the, through the stimulus package from the government. So statistics that will come along with research. And then second thing, maintaining funding moving forward. Yeah. Continuous and consistent financial support. Okay, good, yes. thank you. And uh, Liz? Um, so most of the things I would have thought have been mentioned, but one of the now for me, you can repeat them because it reinforces them. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll repeat. Of course, capacity building is a must. Yes. Uh, but then now I realize that also we perhaps need to think of a, 
a creative art dispute resolution center uh, because when you look at the creative industry, uh, when we have sort of a lot of disputes, it slow mm. downs the creative industry in general. Mm. You know, the creativity process, the the economic process of the creative mm. side sort of slows down because people are just fighting, and and you know, we, the court system does not favor IP because of the bureaucracy and the and the procedures involved. So I think for me now, a uh, a dispute resolution center for the creative arts would be something now we can perhaps think to do and put together. Interesting. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Bwana Fula. Okay, thank you. Uh, you got me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, me, uh, from my side, I think what we need more, we need further engagements. Eh? Further engagements among the stakeholders. Mm. And in these engagements, we should do, we should build uh, frameworks that can actualize government initiative mm. because without uh, we need to do more further engagement talking to each other uh, uh holding conversation with each other and then we we, we we develop frameworks that can actualize uh, some of the government initiatives that are there now apart from the from the entertainment sector i think this uh, uh this creative economy also has to do with the other, other things like art and crafts mm -hmm. like on the issue of art and crafts I don't think that uh, we need to, to we need supportive policy uh, to enhance ex, ex, export, export related policy. Mm -hmm. And we may even go in for things like special economic zones, whereby mm -hmm. this uh, art, uh, creative arts, uh, arts and uh, handcrafts can be, can be manufactured or, or, or can, be, can be manufactured and then there's aggregation, putting them together and, uh, and, and for export. So I think that can also improve because most of our arts, especially the 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 the, 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 the hand the handcrafts, like from the Maasai, the Kamba, the Kisis, they're just there. Nobody's buying them, and they, they people are looking for market. They can't find it. But I think if you can have supportive policy, we can enhance export, especially if you can have what you call a special economic zone, where we we put them together and they're done there, and then they, uh, we export them. It, it doesn't include even the fashion, like most of our the the, the ladies uh, ladies. Uh, <laughs> Uh, ladies' dresses, eh? they are very good. When they uh, from the start, they going to like them, but they don't know how to buy them. Hmm? They come and see the kitangas and all those, uh, and they like them, and they they say, "How can I? Where can I buy this? If I, if, I, if this was in my country, I'll, I'll buy it." But now, you see, we, we we are not doing much on that. So I think if we can do that, we can uh, we can improve on uh, on our economy. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much to the panelists. I'd like to um. Let's see whether we are ready with the poll results. Are we ready with that, Hazita? Yes. Okay. So there they are on the screen. I hope we can all see that. So the first question, should the recent government stimulus program for the creative sector be institutionalized going forward to grow the sector? And of those present, 96% said yes, and 4% said no. At another forum, we'll understand why we agreed and why we disagreed, but not this one. And for the second question, should the creative sector and the media be self-regulating with regard to freedom of artistic expression? And again, yes, 91% and 9% no. And of course, because we don't have a chance to, to discuss these further, it's, we, we will take them as they are, but it would be interesting to understand why we are saying yes and why we are saying no. Thank you very much for that, Hazita, and thank you very much everyone who has taken part in that, in that small poll. But now it's my pleasure to thank all of the panelists. I'd like to thank um, Mr. Edward Sigay, Dr. Mshai Mangola, Mr. Benjamin Mushiri, Mr. Simon Maura, Ms. Liz Lenjo, Mr. Nyongesa Wafula, for really, uh, I think, an excellent exchange. Even though we probably had the smallest number that we've had uh, for these resilience, I think that it's been one where there's been a very deep and important exchange around concrete steps forward, but also the interdependence and connectedness across sectors and how important it is for us, I think, as Nyongesa said at the very end, for us to keep engaging and to keep trying to see how we develop frameworks that are holistic and that enable not just the creative economy to thrive, but the whole economy ultimately. So thank you all very much for, for being with us for, for this period of time and for your wonderful insights. It's now my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Kimani Njogu of Toyza Communications, but he's also chair of the Creative Economy Working Group to make some closing remarks on behalf of all of the Resilient Partners. 
Professor Kimani, karibu. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joy, for the opportunity. Thanks a lot, uh, panelists and the attendees. Uh, I'd like just to say a few words um, as we wrap up um, this, this session of the Resili Art um, you know, convenings. As, as you all know, this is the third um, convening um, of the Resili Art um, meetings. And really, we've come out with fantastic ideas. Uh, we have seen that um, uh, our artists have been affected by COVID-19. Um, but we have also seen that they have been able to turn around and continue to be relevant, not just by doing the work that, that they have always done, but also uh, inspiring communities, uh, giving people hope, entertaining people, you know, and, and using the available platforms to continue work. Um, so this is very important so that they have seized the opportunity that COVID-19 has provided and activated technology uh, to continue being relevant. Um, of course, there are, there are fundamental questions that um, we've, uh, that have been raised. There are questions related to the stimulus package. Uh, and I think that there is a feeling that um, the stimulus package was a very good idea. The government stepped in to support uh, the sector, but that there is need also to look at how that could be uh, better managed uh, going forward. Um, the, 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 the investment uh, by government uh, on the sector has been um, appreciated, but again, there is work to be done. Um, the, there is also conversation that we have had related to the sports, arts, and uh, social development uh, fund. And again, something came out that was very important um, is that there is an opportunity for us to engage that fund so that it serves the sector even, even better. Um, we have, of course, listened to uh, Kekobo over the copyright amendment, um, the, the copyright amendment bill 2019. And we have seen the benefits are coming out of that related to streamlining CMOs um, and increasing accountability platforms and containing piracy and so on. So there is progress um, in, in, that, in that area. There is one area that I have, we didn't hear much about, which is basically um, intellectual property uh, rights and the national framework for intellectual property and whether KIPI is, um, is working in that area to make sure that um, we continue benefiting. Um, the webinars have raised questions related to artists' working environment, artistic freedom, democratization of digital space, and how policies can be developed and reformed to serve the creative sector even better um, so that are, we are able to, to, um, to distribute our content um, and, and, and also to create uh, much more progressively. Um, and we have heard that democratizing the digital space is utterly crucial for the sector. In fact, one panelist said that uh, the internet needs to be seen as a public good and it needs, we need to, to be able to invest um, on, the, on the internet. Um, I think that is conversation about the importance of taking this, um, uh, the creative sector uh, much more broadly so that we are not just talking up um, as Kenyans, but we are reaching to the rest of Africa and developing a Pan-African framework for advocacy. Um, and, and, and I think this is very important, especially when we are saying that the arts and culture need to be integrated much more purposefully, deliberately in national development agendas um, so that they are not seen to be footnotes in the, in the national development, but actually um, key to uh, socioeconomic transformation of the, of the continent. Uh, there have been questions related to, to monetization um, of, the, of the sector, where the one is talking about offline platforms as well as online platforms and issues of equity um, so that uh, everybody gets a fair share of the, of the, market, of the, market, um, the marketplace. Um, I, I think that, again, in most of the webinars, there are questions that have been raised related to availability of data, reliability of data, utility of data, and the role of, of government and civil society and practitioners in availing these, um, these, these data. 
There is also something else that I think that came out, which is really, really important. The importance of um, networks, uh, creative sector networks uh, to solidify, you know, the advocacy work. And I think that um, um, in addition to the sectors being, uh, the, the, the networks being for the sector, I think reaching out to other groups becomes very, very important where those groups are, um, are um, uh, legal entities and, and, and so on. So we have come out with very important ideas. Um, and I think that those ideas will be followed up. We'll be able to try and sift them to see what uh, can be acted on. Now, as I conclude, I just want to say that uh, the webinars have been a result of a partnership between the regional office for UNESCO um, as well as the Kenya National Commission for UNESCO, the Minister of Sports, Culture and Heritage, uh, the Creative Economy Working Group, Alliance Francais, the Gordon Arts Center, um, and, and really everybody that participated in this. And we are grateful uh, to the partnership between the UN agencies, the government pra practitioners in arts and culture, the private sector and cultural institutions. I want to really, again, on behalf of all the partners, thank uh, Michael Soy for the artwork and Kidum and Ketebul for the music, um, which really made uh, the webinars uh, come out alive. And to also mention Alliance Francais for providing technical support um, throughout the webinars. Uh, Hasita Waters and your team did fantastic work in ensuring that our technology uh, worked without a hitch. Um, and again, on behalf of the, uh, of the conveners to say that it is these type of partnerships that actually will deliver uh, for the sector. Uh, again, on behalf of the partners, to really thank the panelists and the attendees for their commitment. And we are immensely, as usual, very grateful to join Boya for excellent moderation, um, making sure that uh, we get the issues out, synthesizing them and getting all of us involved. So really, really grateful um, for this. We hope that the issues raised in the webinars and the recommendations that have come out will be picked up by each one of us, as well as our institutions for further engagement, and that there will be a, a development of an implementation plan of some of these issues so that we can enhance the sector, um, uh, you know, and, and really make it contribute intensely, um, whether or not there is COVID. So on behalf of every, everybody, I want to say thank you very much and really wish you good health and safety at this time. Thank you, Joy, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Kimani. And again, thank you all once more. So this brings us to the end of the Resiliat sessions. Um, I'd like to ask you all to leave <laughs> so that we can then just have a small catch up with the panelists. So just a small review of the panelists. So to kindly ask the panelists to, uh, to stay for just another further five or 10 minutes so that we can hear from you how you also found this session. But thank you to all of the attendees. I can see people attending from outside of Kenya and within the country as well, across the nation. Thank you all very much. And thank you for your comments along the side. Thank you, thank you and take care, be safe. <laughs>